In recent years, immigration has been all over the news. It was the largest workplace raid by U.S. officials in more than a decade. Border Patrol agents and immigration officers are being instructed to detain... And but even though we hear about the numbers and the impact of immigration policies, when we look closer, the immigration story is mostly a family story. When it's not a matter of survival... People usually leave their homeland because they want a better life for their children, their parents, their partners. Or because they want to be together with someone who left first. I wanted to have a better life for her and a better future and work hard so that she could keep growing the way that she was. When people migrate, their move affects the place where they arrive and the place they leave. Their relationships change. Families sometimes endure long separations. The immigrant story is invariably a story of longing. This is Here and Now at the Huntington, a series of audio essays produced by the Huntington Library, Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. I'm your host, Giovanna Romano Sanchez. In this episode, we bring you two immigrant stories, one from our archives and the other from our gardens. And we look at the changes in these people's relationships after they crossed the border, and how writing letters helped them cope with isolation and longing. In 2012, when Professor Miroslava Chavez Garcia moved with her family to Santa Barbara, California, she received a visit from her uncle. He brought a package of letters with him. I remember him putting them on the table like, boom, like, here they are. They were all in envelopes. And I remember picking them up and taking them out and opening them and just looking at the writing and just saying, wow, you know, what's here? This is so fascinating. The package had 85 letters that her parents exchanged before they got married between 1963 and 1966. At that time, her dad, José Chávez Esparza, had just immigrated to the U.S. as part of the Bracero program, which brought millions of Mexican farm workers to the United States. José came to work at a job that would allow him to be financially stable and help his family back in Mexico. But he felt lonely and would go back to Mexico whenever he could, that's where he was during Christmas of 1963. He went out with some friends in his hometown of Cavillo in central Mexico. And at some point in the night, he saw Maria Concepcion Alvarado, or Conchita as she was known. And he couldn't help but go talk to her. And then he says to her, can I write to you? I'd love to get to know you. She said yes. And a few days after the encounter, José wrote her the first letter. Conchita, le saludo primero y le deseo que haya pasado una muy feliz y alegre Navidad en compañía de los suyos, así mismo le deseo para el Año Nuevo. He says, firstly, I greet you and I hope you had a very Merry Christmas in the company of yours and I wish you the same for the New Year. I wanted to write to you soon after I arrived, but I thought it'd be best to wait a few days. You know, Conchita, what you told me, or rather the response you gave me, in reality made me happier than if you would have returned the sentiment or the feelings. Because of what you told me, you demonstrated much sincerity, and that is what I have and what I want for you and me. In conclusion, he says, you seem to me to be in every way wonderful, and I can assure you that I will grow to love you like no other has loved you. It took a month and another letter, to get a response from Conchita. So she writes, Señor José Chávez, so a formal letter. Contesto sus cartas, esperando se encuentre bien. I'm responding to your letters. I hope you're doing well. Firstly, I wanted to ask you for your forgiveness for not having answered. I didn't do so, not because it bothers me that you write to me. Rather, because, in reality, I didn't know what to say. But now I think I can express my feelings towards you. At first, Conchita was very clear that she didn't have romantic feelings for Jose. Look, I don't feel to care for you in a way that would make us more than friends. 
But she told him to keep writing. Then she says a few more things and she ends by saying, look, continue to write to me. I like you for a good friend. And as you say, God will decide. Conchita was only 17 and was about to finish school, which was not very common for young women in central Mexico at the time. Actually, she was among the first cohort of people to do middle school, and she was one of two females in the whole class. So she was not looking to get married or settle down in any ways. But José was persistent and very clear about his intentions. More than just a connection, he actually wanted as he says very quickly into the letters, like, he wants her to be his wife. Eventually, Conchita became more open to Jose's advances, and she decided to give him a chance. As the exchange continued, the relationship grew. Over time, Conchita moved from signing off her letters with Tu Amiga, Your Friend, or Hasta la Proxima, Until Next Time, to phrases like Quien te quiere, The One Who Loves You, and Todo el cariño, with all my love. In the letters, José portrayed himself as a sophisticated and sensitive urban man. He included words in English, handwritten in a carefully crafted straight line on plain paper. But to Miroslava, more than the revelation about his desires, José's letters show the personal isolation and longing he experienced as a single Mexican immigrant living and working in Imperial Valley during the 50s and 60s. After that first encounter, they only saw each other three times before getting married in 1966. That's essentially the last letter he sends her, like, oh, I'm on my way. And within a month or two, they do move to the border, to Mexicali, Baja California. They end up there because she doesn't have her green card and he's working and so he's commuting every day. And as soon as I was born in 1968, we crossed the border and lived in Imperial Valley. The letters between Jose and Conchita are not only a window to look at the past. They were also a way for Miroslava to get to know her parents. So the story is that my parents died when I was young. I was 12 years old. We were in a car accident. We were returning from Mexico. We had been in visiting family during Christmas, and we were on our way home. They were killed, and my grandmother as well, so it was pretty horrific. After the accident, Miroslava and her brother went to live with her uncle and his wife. The same uncle that years later stopped by to give her the letters. You know, going through them, I felt like, wow, these are so special because I feel like, you know, my parents touched these letters. They spent time with them. And then I thought, like, this is a part of them. I'm getting to know them. After spending some time with the letters, Miroslava started to see what was behind them. Then I was like, had this moment. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) I realized this isn't who they were. This is who they were at a particular moment. As a researcher and professor of history, she realized the letters had more than personal value. They were historical documents. As a scholar, it was amazing to see them voicing their desires, their hopes, and their aspirations. Miroslav understood the letters told a broader story, a story of Mexican immigration during the 60s, and of how immigrants navigated social, gender, and economic dynamics across the border. They also revealed the huge effort José made to keep the relationships he had in his home country. We also see how migration impacts those left behind, or as some scholars say, as those who chose to stay behind. So how their identity gets reshaped as well. In 2018, Miroslava published Migrant Longing, Letter Writing Across the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. During the process of writing the book, Clay Stalls, the Huntington's curator of California and Hispanic collections, approached Miroslava about bringing the letters to the Huntington. And we met and we talked about the letters and I provided them to him and was thrilled to know that they would be preserved. Today, the Chavez Garcia collection is kept in the Huntington's archives, where researchers can access them. 
But that's only one of many immigrant stories that permeates the institution. In the Huntington's Rose Garden, we found another José. Hola, ¿cómo estás? José Cervantes. He has been taking care of our plants for the past 12 years. And like Miroslava's parents, José came from central Mexico. He came to the U.S. as an immigrant twice. First, when he was 15. But he had some trouble adapting. So he went back to Mexico and decided to return years later, when he was 24. He had cousins here who were working, and he wanted to try his luck. He wanted to escape from poverty and achieve the American dream. The dream of having a job that would give him a dignified life and the possibility of starting a family. But to do that, he had to endure a long walk to cross the border. With almost no food. That feeling of intense hunger, he says, is impossible to forget. José arrived in November 1983, and he started working the next day, first as a carpenter, then as a driver, and after 15 years, he got his papers and was finally able to go back to Mexico and see his family again. Until then, they were mostly communicating through letters. Jose says that, at the beginning, he didn't know how to write well. And he went back to school, so he didn't have to dictate the letters to his cousins. He didn't want other people reading them. José didn't keep the letters. But in thinking of them, he remembers a difficult time. A time when he didn't speak English at all and depended on his cousins for everything. Now, almost 40 years later, José calls the U.S. home. It was here that he found good work, met his wife, had kids, and now grandkids. He just misses his mom a lot. He once tried to bring her here, but she said, No, I stay here, in Mexico. There's this word in Portuguese, saudade. As Portuguese speakers, we like to say it's untranslatable. But you know the feeling. It's a mix of longing and nostalgia that you can have for places, food or things. But above all, you have saudade for people. Brazilian artist Gilberto Gil puts it very well in a song. He writes... Saudade is the presence of someone's absence. To me, saudade is a bittersweet feeling that you have when you miss someone who left you so many happy memories that you end up smiling instead of getting sad. And even though saudade is a Portuguese word, I would guess it's a constant feeling for most immigrants. It certainly is for me. Today, technology made it cheap and easy to talk and even see family and friends back home. But letters are different. They are material objects that traveled across the border carrying a story. You can touch them. You can see someone's mood in their handwriting. As José said, Receiving a letter brought him so much joy. It's a unique way of being together with who we left. It's also a documentation of an experience, providing a window into a particular time, place and history. 
a small piece of presence in a sometimes long and painful absence. This was the fifth episode of Here and Now at the Huntington. Thank you for listening and stay well.